Commissioner Epperson, do you mind doing a brief prayer uh, for us? And then uh, I can lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. 10-4. Thank you. All and right. and maybe we can just observe a moment of silence very briefly uh, for those who have we have lost uh, uh, to COVID-19 and to uh, gun violence as well prior to uh, uh, the uh, prayer. All right, would you like me to do the roll call first and then we'll- Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, Commissioner Jackson. Here. And Commissioner Gage Watts. Commissioner Epperson. Present. Commissioner Young. Present. And Commissioner Johnson. You have three of five members present and that is a quorum. Okay, great. Let us all, if we would, observe a moment of silence for all of those that have lost loved ones during the COVID pandemic, as well as think of those who had contracted the disease and recovered, as well as all of the gun violence that's been plaguing our nations prior to my invocation. Thank you, I'll now lead us in the invocation. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for allowing your son, Jesus Christ, to come down and be our redeemer so that we may participate in the tree of life. Father, we thank you as to where we are today within this world that you created and created man in your image, giving him dominion over everything therein, over the earth and the seas and all of the lands. Father, we ask your mercy upon all of those who are suffering from whatever their illnesses may be or any social or economic trials that they are going through. Father, we ask that you bless our military, domestically and abroad. And Father, we thank you for all of the things that our senior citizens have undergone to get us to where we are today. These are other blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you, Commissioner Everson. Uh, uh, for those who are active and retired uh, military, you may uh, render a brow salute. Uh, for all others, please place your hands over your heart. Uh, I will uh, lead the pledge and you can kind of just say it silently in your head with me. Um, I, Jeff, do you wanna put the flag up? I pledge one, allegiance. One sec, I'm sorry, uh, no, I'll get it right it. up. And Mr. Shashir, you don't have to stand. Uh, if you if you don't want to, you don't have to. But you know, just in whatever respective way that you'd like to uh, recognize the pledge, we'll do our pledge of allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Next order of business, Mr. Clerk. That brings us to agenda additions. I'm not aware of uh, any agenda additions. Did you have any today? I don't have any. Does any committee members have any additional uh, agenda additions that they would like to have added or discussed uh, to the agenda? Hearing none, the only uh, other item is your motion to approve consideration of items under Louisiana Revised Statutes 42.17.1. Okay, is there any objection to approving that particular item? Is there any move objection? for adoption. All right. Uh, Commissioner Everson moves for adoption by unanimous consent. All right, and uh, so we'll, that passes by unanimous consent. And at this point, I just wanna remind you, no action is necessary, but your certificate of teleconference is attached uh, at this part of your agenda. Um, and that brings Thanks, us to Mr. public Clark. comments. But Jeff, let me just let me just note that uh, this meeting is being conducted uh, via teleconference and Zoom uh, because we do have uh, guests that are with us that are not able to physically uh, uh, be with us in Shre in Cattle Shreveport uh, today, and we do uh, also recognize that we're still uh, working through a pandemic, and there may be members who are uh, primary caretakers for loved ones and who are at higher risk. Well, and thank you for noting that. Would you like uh, Would you like us to move on to public comments? Commissioner Jackson, I think you may have cut out. He is not muted, but I'm, I'm not able to hear you. 
Jeff, we see your face, but we don't see you. We don't hear you. I was the same for me. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think it must have been a sound issue altogether because uh, I could see you, but I couldn't hear you. But I wasn't oh. muted. And you weren't muted. So. Got you. Got you. No, I was just saying that we're meeting uh, via Zoom because that we're still in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, and there are members who are uh, still in the quarantine process and uh, without being able to meet via Zoom uh, per the governor's executive order, we wouldn't be able to achieve a quorum. So that's our purpose for meeting for Zoom. Uh, and thank, thank you for stating that. Uh, would you like to move on to public comments at this time? Yes, sir. Great. Um, so we uh, have not received any electronic public comments for today's meeting, uh, but what I will do is to go ahead and uh, announce the phone number. Uh, that phone number is 318-226-6596. Uh, citizens who want to address the uh, commission are welcome to call that number uh, and will be given three minutes uh, each. Again, that number 318-226-6596. Give it about 15 seconds or so, 10 seconds. Doesn't appear that we've got any calls on the line. Would you like to move on? Yes, sir. Okay, that brings us to new business uh, where our first item is uh, a FEMA update. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Everson. We do have Mr. Um, we have Minor Chase, and I'm sorry if I said Mr. And Mrs. We haven't met her formally, uh, but we right. text we email. Um, but uh, we have Minor Chase with FEMA, uh, who has reached out, and I believe has reached out uh, individually to elected officials. Uh, and so I will turn it over at this particular time. That is correct. I have um, sent out my introductory email to all of the commissioners for Caddo Parish. Um, I sent that out on Friday. So um, unfortunately, we're not able to, without the invitation of the governor, to um, testify in any hearings of public, um, of public officials. But I will um, say that in that email, there's a lot of information there. My contact information is there. So if you want to meet one-on-one, -on -one, any of the commissioners, and I can provide you with detailed information on the FEMA programs that cover the winter storms declaration. And so that's what we're focusing in on now. Um, and please avail yourself of that information. It was on, Feb on Friday. Um, pass that I sent that email out. So, um, but if if not, my email address is in the chat, and so feel free. And my telephone number. Feel free to reach out and contact me if you um, want more information. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Oh, well, thank you, Marla, for for joining us. I know you may have had some uh, our times may have been conflicting, so thank you for accommodating us. I do see uh, Miss Erica Bryant here. Uh, our uh, uh, assistant uh, parish administrator and I guess uh, acting administration uh, administrator in the absence of Dr. Woodrow Wilson. Um, yes, Cattle Parish is home to two dead presidents. Uh, uh, our president of the commission is Lyndon Johnson and our parish administrator is Dr. Woodrow Wilson. Yeah. Woodrow Wilson Jr., I believe, right? Jr.? That's, that's correct. So, uh, <laughs> I always joke with people about that. But um, uh, uh, Mrs. Bryant, if y'all could uh, touch bases and maybe put Mr. Weaver, um, Mr. Ward, um, and um, Robert Jump, who I don't see on the call, uh, who should be, in my thought, should be on all of these calls for future references, uh, y'all, uh, because this is pandemic and emergency response. So if y'all could make sure that they can connect and we maybe have an offline sort of uh, briefing, debriefing. Uh, we have until May 10th, I think, uh, Myrna, we have until May 10th to help push that out. And so let's make sure that we get resources out into the community. Yes, I've made a note of the contact information. Okay. Okay. And Myrna, would you, would you I know you were assigned to elected officials, Myrna, are you, am I saying your name right? Myrna, Myrna. Myrna, okay, I want to make sure, I always like to make sure I get names right. Sure. Um, so uh, would you be okay with maybe an offline conversation with non-elected officials, our staff at the parish who basically uh, do our day-to-day -day operations? Uh, we've been having some conversations about 
things of that nature. So is that okay if they're not elected officials? Uh, so yeah, it would have to be um, elected officials. Um, if, if I'm at the meeting, would that count? Yes, it would. Absolutely. <laughs> there, less than a quorum. Okay. Yes, yes, so this is all, you know, based on the sunshine laws of Louisiana. So Absolutely. We're just, you know, being accommodating with that. Absolutely. So yes, at any time, I, I'll be here for quite a few weeks. And okay. so, you know, but the deadline, May 8th is a deadline for um, preliminary damage assessment that you might want to talk to Mr. Jump about. Okay. And that, that date has been extended uh, because it's just 30 days past the um, declaration date. That's all I'll say. Great, great. Okay. All right. So you got that, Ms. Bryant. We'll maybe have a debriefing <laughs> with, uh, I, would probably no. I would probably suggest uh, maybe myself Commissioner Chavez of Long Range Planning and uh, President Johnson uh, of the, uh, who, who's chair, who's president of the commission, uh, at least the three of us to hop yes, on sir. Go through some of that stuff. Uh, and Myrna, are y'all only doing, are y'all working on only the public assistance side or your individual side or which side? All FEMA programs, has All it mitigation? I, I give you a presentation on that information Okay. Any questions you have, I can forward that on to those subject matter experts to provide you with detailed response to your questions or concerns. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Next item, Jeff. The next item brings us to the SPA update, and we have uh, Mr. Shashil Kamar on the line. All right. Thank you, Shashil. Uh, welcome to the committee. And thank the floor is yours. Thank you, Commissioner Jackson. Myrna, thanks for Thanks for hey, I think he just mute. I think he just muted her. Okay. Thanks for uh, inviting me, Myrna. I, I heard a bit of chatter, so I wanted to make sure that uh, I wasn't interrupting anybody's conversation piece, you know. Uh, pleasure meeting all of you. Um, my name is Sushil, and I'm with the SBA. And our role is pr most probably misunderstood or discounted vis-a-vis -vis the bigger uh, picture, if you will. And hopefully after this presentation, I could uh, leave with an impression of what our role is and how we execute. As you folks know, whenever uh, there is any type of disaster damages, the first step is the Edward Jumps of the world, work with FEMA, SBA, and other areas to um, coordinate disaster uh, assessments to figure out what kind of damages took place. And based on the damages and the threshold of dollars, the state has a um, choice to choose between an agency only declaration, which is 25 homes or businesses or, or businesses that have 40% or more uncompensated losses to request an SBA only declaration, which is an agency. In the case of the winter storms, the threshold was such that the Federal Emergency Management Agency stepped in to assist. And as long as GOSEP requests individual assistance, SBA comes totally with that package. In any disaster of any kind, your first line of defense is always insurance. Having said that, the first step in a presidential declaration is to register with FEMA and get a nine digit number. That is your identifier throughout the course of the presidential declaration. Once you register with FEMA, you apply with the SBA. And let me, you change the word apply to referred on a case by case basis. Um, depending on the disaster, the, the referral levels to the SBA, the Swamp Business Administration, is anywhere as much as 62% or as high as 76%. The reason being our role is to provide liquidity in the form of low interest state disaster loans to renters, to homeowners, to most private nonprofits that don't provide services essential in nature, that's covered by FEMA, and businesses of all sizes. The interest rates are as low as, depending on the disaster, 1.25% for homeowners and renters, 
and 3% for businesses and 2% for private nonprofits. Now, since this is my first interaction with you folks, after this meeting, what I'm planning on doing is sending out all the literature to, to you folks so that you folks have it to address and reference and pass it on and put it on your uh, county website, so on and so forth. And on a moment of pride, let me just share it with you. Cato Parish is home to my parents and also to my brother-in-law and sister. And as I was mentioning to Mr. Bernstein, my brother-in-law is the Dean of Graduate Studies at LSU. And my sister is a practicing attorney. And as a matter of fact, I was just in Shreveport literally two weeks ago. Oh, so I love Shreveport. I've um, always been a big fan of Shreveport. My daughter briefly worked there too. And so when I say that I love you guys, it's not from the sake of, I want your butt lights, you know? Um, so having said that, um, this, as soon as you referred over to the SBA, please make sure that if you're a renter or a homeowner, that you complete the package. The reason being, it's a hard stop. The framers of the disaster recovery had in mind that between the grant space assistance for FEMA, safe, secure, sanitary condition up front on the individual assistance side, and SBA's low interest rate disaster program, the jargon unmet needs created by the disaster, close parentheses, are met with the combination of the two programs. So if an applicant chooses not to move forward with the SBA referral, it's a hard stop. If you have a lot of hand wringing and I don't qualify, I don't want a loan, this, that, and that, make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. Apply and get turned down so that the other needs assistance administered by FEMA gets opened up. It is a qualifier because there are certain other needs assistance criterion that are met when you apply with the SBA and get turned down so that that pot of money is opened. If the SBA is able to prove, they'll make loans up to $40,000 for renters, for personal property, up to $40,000 for homeowners with property, up to $2 million for businesses of all sizes between economic injury and physical damages, and most private nonprofits, including houses of worship or physical damages. That's key. Because if we approve you, that basically means that you do qualify. So this whole notion that I don't want a loan and I can't afford a loan goes out the window. Because your own assessment of your financial situation may have been a little too hard on yourself and there is money available for you to recover. And these monies can be used for automobiles, sofas, living room furniture, anything that's called personal property and or damages to your home, to your roof, to to water damages to the living room, to your floors, things along those lines, okay? So any and all damages to your home, including fences and including landscaping, there's a small portion that's set aside from the 200,000 that I mentioned. And of course, houses of worship for $2 million. Now here's the part of economic injury that I wanna share with you. The definition of economic injury is, if Mr. Jackson, if you run a business and you can't pay your bills on time, because you are owed a check from uh, Mr. Henry and he's in a world of hurt because he's also in the middle of a disaster. Both of you, depending on your, uh, your parish declaration could apply for assistance so that the revenue shortfall can be met and your bills can be paid. The only thing you can do, and I'll say only, it's a sweeping statement when I say is enrich yourself, in the form of shareholder appropriations and paying yourself a salary at the expense of working capital. It's really a working capital loan. So in other words, all the bills that you would normally pay, Mr. Jackson and uh, Mr. Bernstein, bills that have to do with product, people, inventory, mortgages, utilities, anything that you would pay on as, as part of an ongoing business and that you can't pay now suddenly because your revenue dried up, it could be used to pay those bills not only get uh, multiple shots at the well, um, depending on which particular declaration you're going for, because concurrent with the winter storms, we still have the COVID-19 assistance available for businesses in Cato Parish or in all of Louisiana, whereas the winter storms is pretty much on the northern side of it all. I'm thinking it's up north from West Baton Rouge uh, because the winter storms hit them particularly hard, correct? So you can literally borrow money for COVID because since this is a pandemic, discussion, I'm bringing in other uh, avenues of disaster assistance and or um, access to capital, if you will. 
So you can borrow those monies to pay your bills, okay? And the, the mathematics of it all is benchmarking. What does that mean? What did you do in the corresponding time frame a year ago and the year before that, right? So if you're looking for assistance during the month of January, in this case, it has to be February because that's when the uh, declaration was and the incident period was, what did you do in 2020 before the pandemic? And what did you do in 2019? So for example, let's say 2019 and 2020 was $20,000 a month. Your gross profit was 50%. Okay. And in this particular year, your revenue fell off the face of the earth and you're at $10,000 and your percentage shrunk down to 25%. The, what did that $10,000 do to your income statement? As the accountants in the group might say, below the line and top of the line, above the line is gross profit, below the line is net profit. What did your SGNA not get paid? Which item? And can that be cash flowed over a 30 year term? If the answer is yes, for the most part, the loan is yours. On a case-by-case -case basis, we're able to lend money for refinancing purposes, okay? As long as we can lend money to have you repair your uh, property, this is for homeowners and commercial properties. In the case of homeowners, it's gotta be below 200,000. Your mortgage has to be below that number and the amount of damages that you've assessed that we're lending you has gotta be below that. And then there are a few other criterion. If you meet that criterion and stay below 200 grand, we can refinance the whole thing for the interest rate of 1.25% as low as. Now, let me give you a small example, if I may. Next door, during Hurricane Harvey and the current presidential uh, winter storms in Texas, I'm, I'm the PIO for um, Texas also. We have had several instances of folks taking advantage of the refinance option. To give you a small example, we had a lady that was working in, um, in the Jefferson County you know, tax co courthouse, in other words. Did I say that right? You get, you get the drift. Um, and she basically was qualified for a second. It's a cash flow loan, so we don't care what position we go in as a collateral piece. And her first was 40000 We lent her 140000 approved her for And she says to Sheila, I can't afford two notes. My first note, even though it's only 40000 is $900 a month. And my second that you're proposing to lend to, to me is 479. So that puts me at 1379. I can't afford 1379 on my county salary. When we finished refinancing, her net note was 575. And because the payments were deferred for a year in that particular disaster case, she was able to set aside the amount of her payments, $900 for the first year. And she called me crying literally in happiness about a year ago and said, Sushil, I have $11,000 in the bank, which I have not seen in almost a decade. So when we were able to assist in the lives of the many by simple program features that you have to take advantage of, and the first step is to register and then apply with the SBA, all these things wouldn't be, would be, wouldn't be you know, known to the community, if you will. Last but not least, there is, I mean, there's much more parts of the program, but I'm covering it at a 50,000 foot level, if you will. There is a summon of insurance proceeds. And that's a key fact for those folks who are working with insurance companies. Their role is to minimize claims, rightfully so. That's what they're there for. They also take time in paying out the checks. So rather than wait to settle with the insurance company, a summon of insurance proceeds is a valuable tool to use. So basically what will happen is, Mr. Bernstein, I'm going to use you as an example again. You have a home for $100,000. You have a home for $100,000. Let me rephrase that. You have damages to your home for $100,000. Your insurance only covers 80,000. SBA will pick up the difference, $20,000 as long as you can cash flow over a 30 year time frame. Rather than waiting for that $80,000 check to come in, we will take a sum out of insurance proceeds, lend you the entire 100 and have the 80,000 prepay your loan without any type of issue whatsoever. So that particular piece is not only time value of money, peace of mind, and you get to start repairing your home fairly quickly rather than waiting. And here's the, here's the anecdotal part. I'm hearing that's anywhere between 35 to 50 days for claims to be paid. That puts you on the outside of the statutory time frame for disaster declaration. In other words, our declaration from start to finish is 60 days unless the governor requests an extension. Last piece of footnote, Mr. Jackson. One in five businesses that stay closed 
for the first five days of a disaster have a 90% probability of failure in the first year. National statistic, not Louisiana specific. And I am aware because of my proximity to, to my two states that most businesses did not reopen for at least 10 days. Melting and people in the South are not used to driving in the snow. I, you know, I for one learned how to drive in the snow, so on and so forth. And jokes aside, it's treacherous. People didn't open, they didn't go anywhere. Governor said, stay at home, so on and so forth. So you have a situation where a lot of businesses didn't open strictly for safety reasons, driving conditions and everything else. So what do you do? You need to apply. So having said that, I think I've taken a little bit more of my time than anyone if he intended. I apologize for that. But I wanted to cover it in some level of compre in a comprehensiveness, if you will, so that the bigger picture gets captured. And I look forward to meeting with you individually and or a separate uh, Zoom meeting to meet the needs of the many. Thank you very much. Erica, appreciate your uh, contact information and everyone else on the call. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Shashil. Uh, and I'm, my hope is that we will get with you uh, to uh, definitely uh, package and me message uh, these resources that are out there. Uh, as I drive through my district, I still see where um, structures were collab have, have collapsed. I know there's a gas station that's just outside of my district where that entire, um, I guess you could call it canopy thing. That's right. It, it completely collapsed. And so uh, these resources are out there. Um, um, and I think, you know, the programs that you offer, the assistance that you offer can... Um, can definitely uh, help. What I would like to see at some point, uh, uh, is Ms. Bryant still on, is that we probably uh, see how we can maybe get a street team or some boots on the ground to go through. And I know Cattle Parish is pretty large, but in some kind of way, uh, boots on the ground. Uh, Shashil, I don't know if you have leaflets or door hangers or some little one pages or you could just we could just hand those out to businesses as well as homeowners, maybe put them in places, barbershops, those places where people kind of frequently hang out, spa centers, um, uh, maybe even can probably get with uh, Monica Wright with Cattle Council on Aging. If you had seniors, can probably just drop something in there, in their deal. If Martha White is doing a, um, if the food bank is doing a food drive anytime soon within the next week or so, just drop something in those uh, so that people can just have that stuff, place them at the churches as well. Uh, I would love for your assistance to, um, I'm working with Kalisha Garrett, okay. um, you know, uh -huh. on the chamber side. So if you could arrange for a, um, a mini Zoom meeting with her for her um, many um, black chamber members, if you will. Okay. Um, that would be one. I did a, an interview with uh, Nina Montgomery at Cumulus Radio a few okay. weeks back. So okay. I'd like to do a repeat. I've talked to Alexandra Meacham over at uh, KMSS TV. I mean, okay. these are folks that I've worked, had a pleasure working with over years. Yeah. So they're on a first name basis. So we did some brief inter introductions a couple of weeks back. Uh -huh. But I think something along the lines of NPR. So this is, this is something really small. I get my hair cut over at uh, Great Clips on uh, URI. So I basically was out there talking to them while I was waiting, right? Walking to the Target in Uri, same thing. Hey, what do you do? What are you doing here to see my driver, California driver's license? Hey, this is what I do. So, you know, I've done that small piece, but there's a lot of work still needs to be done. Right. And so anything I can do to facilitate that, that'd be great. I would love to work with, uh, I know it's a city level. I would love to work with Mayor Perkins and his team. And if you could make facilitate all that, let me know. And I'll be glad to, to do my part in not only providing literature, for uh, for you folks to do the, uh, the, I'll send that to you after the meeting, but also Zoom meetings because that's right. where it is. Right. Or you know, call-in shows where people can call in, you know, and you folks know the area better than I do. Uh, I mean, I'm engaged, but you guys are living it every step of the day. So whatever I can do, I'm here for you. Okay. Well, we definitely don't want, and I agree with you about the businesses being uh, shut down um, and they were already reeling from a pandemic. So it's really important that we get the resources. Are there any other questions from committee members uh, for Mr. Shishil or any staff members have any questions at this time, feel free. 
And while questions are being contemplated, uh, Mr. Jackson, there's also the SVOG program that, that's on the on the way out, Shutter Venue Operators Grant that came out. There's targeted advanced program. And there's a lot of the SVA programs which are out there. So perhaps with your um, leadership and advocacy and everyone else on this team, perhaps we have a small um, mini high level conference on all the programs available to businesses. I mean, you mentioned uh, businesses, you know, and I mentioned Black Chamber, you know, the, the SBA is out there to talk to business owners and setting aside time for business owners with less than 20. Why wouldn't we want to do the same? Right. So let's build on the momentum that's out there and let's deliver for the needs of the many. Absolutely. Well, you can rest assured, I think the one we did for our rental assistance program went well. You can rest assured we will be in, um, you can rest assured we will be in touch um, for the remainder, for, for that idea. I, I love that idea and uh, would be glad to do that. Erica, did I see your hand up? No, no, sir. I was just um, shaking, nodding my head. That okay. um, I thought that that was a good idea, and that okay. uh, we can work together to try to get um, a conference like that established. Okay, great, great. Okay, um, we will get that going. And uh, I don't see any other commissioners' hand in the queue. So our uh, next item, Mr. Clerk. Next item is going to be uh, the well. The next item that we have scheduled is an update from Catagosa regarding winter storm. Um, I don't know that I see a representative from their office on the call. No, Adam, um, Adam assistant uh, administrator. We got to have them here for these meetings, don't we? I don't want to act out in front of the company. Uh, <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> they, they were they were invited. Just uh, for the record, they, they I, know you, I, I know you do your part, Jeff. Yeah, know you know. You. I mean, sometimes a day's notice is 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 hard when your calendar is already booked. But yeah, we'll make sure. <laughs> Always have a number two, but we got it. We we gonna make an exception this time. We gonna make an exception this time. Um, even if they can send a written report, we would appreciate it. Uh, and I got a note from um, Dr. White saying that she was uh, at a medical appointment. So we'll move on. I do know that our, our test positive rates have gone up. Um, and uh, I, I'll send her a note just asking if, if she can give us something in writing, uh, kind of just a briefing in writing that we can share out. Uh, Jeff, when she sends it, maybe share with all commissioners and staff uh, when she forwards that to her. We'll do that. Yeah, she does have some some interesting numbers to share. I'm, I'd imagine. Okay, next, uh, Mr. Clark. Okay, that brings us to U.S. Treasury Emergency Rental Assistance Update. All right. Who who do we have to speak on that? Yes, sir. Um, we now have about 3,400 applicants for the rental assistance program. Right. We will be cutting the first checks for that program this Thursday. Um, we continue to uh, process the applicants. Um, getting the various documents and also doing the verification process. So um, right now we think that the program is going well. We are still marketing, um, trying to get as many people to sign up as um, possibly can, letting them know that we have this assistance available for them. So um, right now we think the program is running smoothly. We are um, in constant communication with the um, partners and trying to um, address any concerns they have as well as working with the administrator to address any concerns that, uh, any feedback that we're receiving in, in far as um, addressing or um, enhancing the program. Great. Mm -hmm. And committee members want to speak out or have any questions? Commissioner Epperson? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can say the uh, rental assistance program, is, the, the word is really out there. I saw some, uh, some ads uh, prior to the uh, 10 o'clock news on all the channels, I saw the graphics that were put out and most people that I encounter uh, personally are aware of it. And if we could emulate that with, uh, with FEMA and SBA, I think we'd be doing a great service to Cattle Parish. Great. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Epperson. Uh, I've heard about those ads as well and I see them on social media as well. So uh, good job on advertising. Commissioner John Paul Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a question for Ms. Bryant. Ms. Bryant, do you know um, if all the 3,400 applicants are uh, going to be able to have access to funding for rental assistance? 
Um, if they qualify, if they meet the guidelines, they should, based on the amount of dollars we have available, there mm-hmm. is assistance available. And if they meet the guidelines, they should get funded. It's only whether or not you meet the income and the other verification sure. process. So um, do you have any idea about, like, do you have a ballpark of how many qualified applicants could get rental assistance in Cato? Well, I mean, we've said that we have about 6,000 um, eligible folks in the area, but that doesn't mean they all would get assistance. So, I mean, we think that we can help a large group of people. And that's not considering the additional funds that we may receive through the American Rescue Plan. Okay. So this is, uh, there are more funds. Uh, this is just from the first tranche of American Rescue Plan funds? Yeah, this is the first okay. um, under the previous act. Yes, sir. Okay, and so may I may I ask a follow up? Um, in our meeting last week, I heard some discussion about um, an element of the selection process that was a lottery, and I didn't really want to talk about it in the main meeting because uh, I assumed it was a little detailed. But could you tell me a little bit about that and uh, how it works and why it's needed? Sure, I'm gonna let uh, Ms. Barnett give you more details on the um, the lottery system. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners. So the lottery system was put in place to make it a a fair playing field for all participants. So uh, initially we, we, we thought about, you know, first come first serve, but then we realized that we likely would put those that are disadvantaged at an additional disadvantage, meaning those individuals that didn't have access to a computer or mobile device or perhaps needed assistance with the application would all automatically <clears throat> be at the bottom of the list for assistance. Mm. And so that was kind of our thought process is that to put those that are already disadvantaged in the same at the same chance of funding at the same time as someone that has a computer and a mobile device and doesn't need help, we decided to do it as a lottery system. Now if you were, if you got into, if you applied in the first several days and you weren't drawn in the first draw, you're, you're still back in the draw. You will always stay until you get drawn. And currently, if all applicants that have applied uh, or actually meet all the eligibility requirements, everybody at this point will receive funding. We've got the funds to cover that. Um, The question was asked, how many families could we cover our estimate based on what we think the need is? We feel like we can help 6,000 families. Uh, However, you you have to have more than 6,000 to apply because a lot of them are not eligible, um, unfortunately. But that was the purpose of the lottery system. It was, um, we we being the team that implemented, we, we tossed around all the ideas and we just thought this would be this would keep the disadvantage from being disadvantaged even more so. Okay, um, may I ask a follow-up question? So the, um, so let's say I'm in the lottery, what are my chances of winning? Is it one in three or is it one in a million? One. Your, your chances of winning are one in one because if you are eligible, you will be funded. We, we're gonna have more of an issue getting rid of spending all the money than we, we're gonna have, our work is getting applications. Uh, so you might not be first in line, you might not be the first one funded, but as we stand, we do not anticipate running out of funds before we fund every applicant. Okay, um, may I, let me ask another question, if I may. Uh, if, if we think we're gonna have enough money to fund 100% of people, um, and we're concerned about not getting enough people to apply, maybe not spreading the word enough, um is there um and so all the all the disadvantaged people are going to like people who don't have a computer all those people are going to get funding as soon as they get their application in but their funding isn't going to be jeopardized by anybody's funding who comes before that someone who has a computer or a more sophisticated landlord type um is that correct so they won't nec- the disadvantaged won't necessarily get uh, selected before someone that was able to do it on their own. They just but they will get money. Yeah. They will get the funding. Yeah, and just just as a reminder, um, 
the tenant it goes directly to the, the landlord. Yes, the applicants don't get anything. It goes directly right. to the landlord. Yeah. Right. So, um, I it um, how long? What what is the maximum delay that the system allows for? So, like, if I so, um, the lottery it seems doesn't weed out people from getting funding. It just um, rearranges the times at which people get funding. So I suppose maybe you collect applications for a week. Maybe you have a hundred applications. It's probably more. And then, um, and then through the lottery, you sort through those and some percentage of them get funded that week. Do you know what that percentage is? Well, that percentage is going to vary um, because say, let's say the first, the first uh, day um, we got over 1200 applications. Um, and then of course it has dwindled down to about an average of 65 to 70 a day from that point forward, we had a big rush. So the first week um, we actually went three weeks just getting applications and kind of feeding uh, the pipeline, if you will, with applicants. And then we did our first draw of 300 applicants. So out of all the applications we received up to that point, we drew 300. And then they started working on those 300 to get the, uh, the necessary documents to verify eligibility. So the reason why we try to, ma we try to manage um, the people that were working, the files that were working so that nobody is um, overwhelmed and we can give the proper attention to each applicant. So I, see, so I think I might not have understood before. The lottery applies to um, applications that have not yet been scrutinized for qualifications. Is that yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so it doesn't, the lottery does not apply to post scrutiny applications that are deemed qualified? No, sir. Once they're deemed qualified, we're going to cut a check for it. We're just trying to manage our expectations and manage our workflow. By right. So this is really, it's, this is really, the lottery is really so that it's manageable for our staff so that they can get it done. Manageable for our staff and to make it fair for, for all applicants. Um, okay. Well, um, that, that makes, that makes sense to me. I thought that the lottery was applied to post qualified applicants and then it was just um, you know deciding on what time scale they'd be paid. Um, can I so one more, one more question is uh, if they if an applicant doesn't get picked up uh, for a review for qualification in the first week or the second week, do you have a do you have sort of a stop uh, measure to make sure that nobody uh, nobody's application gets um, accidentally pushed uh, many weeks before it's reviewed uh there's there's no such measure like that it's it's completely it's completely random okay uh, do you I'm, it might be worth it might be worth checking the dates on some applications like eventually to make sure that you know if somebody loses the lottery for review for you know two months that it, it might you know it might seem unfair to them that's all yeah thanks Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Barnett and Ms. Bryant. Uh, those, those are all my questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. No problem. Um, I, I want to ask some questions about the lottery as well. So I get the piece about the uh, those who may not have access to a computer and have to do it in person and may have to have somebody walk them through that, that category. Um, but, but I just, I want to make sure I understand it correctly that the that the lottery, I just heard that the lottery is for post inspection. Is that correct? No, pre inspection. Pre inspection. Yeah, so the lottery happens. So I don't know if anybody's even went in and, and just done an application just for the fun of it, but the That'd lottery smart, happens. Right? <laughs> I thought about it, but I said that. So, might, I mean, yeah. I understand. I mean, because you, you would just, Anyway, so the lottery, it, there's an initial application where it's just high level information that at that point is when the lottery happens, the lottery happens and then you start putting, giving your lease and your unemployment letter or your eviction notice or whatever documents that are required to approve your eligibility. Once that happens, there is no more lottery. Once you have 
found once you have documents and you have uploaded those and proved your eligibility, you are on the path to be paid. And we pay it now. We will do our first payment this week, and then we will pay every week after that. Now, this first payment will probably be our smallest payment because we'll have we, you know, I think at right now we only have 58 applicants that have finished the entire process. We're at a 10% rate of people that have gotten chosen for the lottery that have not responded. So, but next week we're going to have even more people in the pipeline, even more people that are finished. So we're going to have an even bigger payment. So we're, if you could, if you will, we're just kind of loading the pipeline. So to keep it a manageable work level, but the lottery is from the initial application, not from when you're, once you're proven eligible, you'll be paid that week. The lottery is just to kind of get the names on and out of the hat who's going to be requesting the documents. So, so again, so the lottery is so I could theoretically 20 people can apply at the same time. And of those 20 people, five can be chose. And so those other 15 just have to stay in the lottery until their name is chose and their application is vetted. Correct. But I will say that we had a first draw of 300 on two Wednesdays ago. And then we had another draw this Wednesday uh, and we did 350. So let's say the people at the, that got the first draw, now it's up to them to provide the documents. So the people that were in the second draw, if they were on the Johnny on the spot and providing their documents, their application could very well be paid before the people in the first draw. So it's very, it's very uh, important that the people respond and provide the documentation. That's really after the lottery, that's what's going to trigger um, how quickly they get the payment. So, so cutting the checks, that going back to those 20 people, cutting the checks, those five, you'll cut a check maybe if all their stuff gets in, you'll cut a check for five people. And then it's possible that the next draw may pull out two people. And let's say one of those two turns in all their documentation, you'll cut a check for one person. Then the next lottery happens and you get three. And of those three, all three. And so y'all don't see that as a bit cumbersome with regard to processing payments and things of that nature. Or is it just okay? No, it's actually working uh, very well. We've got a handle. We can, based on how many people's uh, documents are loaded, we can know how much of a draw. So let's say we have a lot of people that, that comply with the requirements of the documentation. So that just means next Wednesday we'll draw even more out of the system. And so it keeps us a manageable uh, number of applications that we're always working. It makes it very manageable to do it I think, I think, and again, I'm not, I'm not telling y'all how to run the program. I just think that it creates a level of, I get the workflow piece. Um, I, I trust me, I get it. I get the workflow piece, but I guess the feedback that I'm getting from landlords and renters is we apply together this person got funded or this person got chose in the lottery, not funded. This person got chosen in the lottery. I didn't, what's going on? And, and I, I of course you can, course, hold on, hold on. Of course you can always say, of course you can always say, and that's my typical response is, uh, my typical response is they'll eventually get to you in the lottery. But then they come back and say, well, if you got the money, why not just pay it? And so it creates this sort of perception that we just kind of putting barriers in place. Well, we can't pay the money until we verify that they're eligible. I, I, right. Haley, I'm not saying that you wouldn't verify. I'm saying at, you, the lottery is to go through the verification, right? Right. 
So what I'm saying is they get put three people apply at the same time and two people get well two two of those three get pulled for verification person number three is wondering why haven't they been contacted for their information they're frustrated and that landlord is trying to figure out well i submitted names for five people and of those five only two got submitted or the other three not funded <clears throat> The frustration that we're catching on the front end of it. Right. Well, Commissioner Jackson, we think that we can have even greater frustration if we don't use this lottery system. If we got overwhelmed and couldn't process the applications because we're getting that feedback from some of the parishes that they're having trouble because they're trying to process first come, first serve, and they're getting overwhelmed. And some of them are even considering shutting down the program because they're so overwhelmed. And we don't want that to happen for us. We know that it could take some time. We know that people are waiting, but ultimately we're gonna work with each person. And we think that we would have greater frustration if we aren't able to process those applications in a, in a, in a way that allows us to be able to control the process and make sure we're working each one and make sure we're addressing each person. Because if we're trying to process 34 applications, first come, first serve, we can, whereas we're working three to 400 a week. I mean, I understand it's gonna be some frustration, but we're trying to work with each person and try to get um, those landlords funded just as quick as we can. And we feel like that ultimately they will be and that in the end, although there was some delay that they felt like maybe it could have been quicker because of the lottery system, ultimately they would get paid. So, so what happens if a person applies in April and they're not pulled until July or June? Well, we would we can review to make sure that that's not, but I don't I don't know that that would happen considering the time frame that they put in in April because someone that applies in June should be I mean it's a random process, but I mean we're going to get to each person. I hear you. I, either way, I guess either way, we can't eliminate the fact that someone would be frustrated by the process of when they would get their check. I don't think that eliminating the lottery system would eliminate frustration with a delay in your check because it, it still could be delayed considering the number of pro applications you have to process. I just, like I say, when somebody gets called, and I don't think it's so much about the delay on the check because if it's if it's the delay in getting it is three people apply and only two of those three people get chose to start turning in stuff i'm obviously if i'm number three i'm sitting back wondering well when am i gonna get chose or why didn't i get chose or did y'all not turn my stuff in what happened and that is what we're catching at least i'm hearing it about the random lottery well one i hear is people say they didn't know it was a lottery right uh, well and they may not have known that they may not they and, may not. so what yes. we can do is we can have you can have those people contact and we can get they can get information on where they are what process all of those questions can be answered so we can if you can have them contact us and we can work through to make sure that uh that person's um, file is being worked and, and and what step in the process and how much longer we think it may take yeah well, I, I just wish that we could, could find a better flow. And maybe uh, I talked with Desiree Honoré yesterday. Maybe if y'all could look to see what the state may be doing to manage their flow. Right. Uh, well, the, yeah, we definitely could check with the state. I mean, you, you recall that the state had to shut down their program because they couldn't previously manage the flow. That so was we want to ensure. Yeah, that was the that, first time. That was so, the first I mean, time things have kind of settled down and they and she admitted she admitted yesterday that they expected. And I think I heard it earlier uh, that they expected to have an influx of applications, but that didn't materialize. And so now, you know, they are just moving forward. That's why they eventually reached out to Louisiana Housing Corporation because they thought they would need the extra help. Well, now the program is moving from Louisiana Housing Corporation back to the Department of Administration for Management because they don't, they don't feel that they need the extra help, the additional manpower now. So um, from what I hear is we didn't get this major influx. I mean, even if y'all just say, hey, we're gonna increase from 
three hundred to five hundred a week. I think that may move oh. it quicker. I don't know. Yeah, and that, that is definitely an option. They can choose more each week. So yes, we'll well yeah we'll continue to talk with the state. We'll continue. You know, you got to remember we only uh, we just opened up April first. So I mean, give us time to go through a month to have data to have to to review. I mean, obviously we're open to um, making adjustments, but it is difficult to make an adjustment just when you've started the program and it's going. So um, we will continue to look at it and continue to analyze the data, continue to talk to the state, continue to hear from our partners, continue to hear from the people right. that are applying. Yeah. And as we, um, if we need to make adjustments, yes, we definitely can look at that, but the, they can look at draw a, a you know, increased number if that is necessary. Well, can we, who is they? The, our, our folks that are working the program, we have a, um, a team that is um, drawing the, doing the draws each week and working with us. So can y'all ask them to go ahead and maybe increase it? I want to make sure that we're getting dollars out the door. Uh, we have that seven million. And my understanding is the state is holding eight million. Is that correct? That's correct. And then there's another possible seven million. Uh, well, we know there's another six to seven million on the way so that's correct now i will say the state hasn't communicated to us they asked to look at our program they have approved it they hadn't communicated to us anything that there's uh, you know i'm not sure why they haven't sent the eight million but there's no problem on our end but yeah that it's that and as well as um yes there should be some additional monies that may be coming yeah well what it sounds like is that it, it, from listening to it and i'm you know there was a lot going on but from listening to it it looks like they're waiting to see if we're going to go through the first tranche of money before they send the other 8 million uh, okay. on it. So that's why I think there, you know, needs to be, because, you know, that eight can easily be diverted to another parish. And that would be, will be kind of where we were last year saying, well, you know, I wish we would have moved it along. Okay. Next thing, Mr. Clerk, enough on rental assistance. Sorry, I had a, uh, my mouse went to sleep. <laughs> I had to unmute. Uh, the next item we've got is an update on the American Rescue Local Government Funds. All right. Uh, uh, any update there, uh, Ms. Bryant? Yes, sir. The only update we... Um... Oh, I, I think we skipped an agenda item. I'm sorry. I apologize. Did we skip? Oh, that's right. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, Mr. Oh, Parker, I'm I sorry. think the next Please. one is discussion of Fairfield Oaks Fire. Okay. That that should be under the same I apologize. agenda item. Let's hit that then. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I uh, I think there may be some visitors here uh, sure. who want to speak about the fire from the homeowners association. Sure. Uh, we'll suspend the rules to hear from Mrs. Is, is this Miss Susan? Yes, Susan. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Miss Susan. Hi. Uh, thank right. you all for having. Thank you first for having me uh, come on. We are we are in the process of, of reeling from a catastrophic fire in building one. Uh, it's the main historic building on Fairfield Avenue. And uh, currently we are being, uh, everything's being investigated. Uh, we don't have a report of origin. Um, as an HOA, we are doing everything and our, uh, and then some to help our, our owners and our displaced residents. Uh, we do have some medical residents uh, that have been displaced. Um, some of our owners uh, do have other family members that have embraced them. Uh, uh, some of the churches have reached out. Uh, Red Cross has been phenomenal. And uh, we are, we as an HOA are taking care of our people. And uh, uh, as far as retrieving items, uh, we're drawing closer because time is very much of the essence here to uh, get these folks uh, items uh, rescued. Now, we have independent insurance agents that um, are coming on board, adjusters to look. Uh, independently as well. So some of this limited access is very limited to uh, social security cards, you know, IDs, uh, passports, uh, those kinds of valuables, but pretty much everything's been gated off. Uh, we have an entire fence around it, secured and posted. 
and uh, we do have uh, security at night for 12 hours, you know, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So, uh, as an HOA, we are embracing this community. It's uh, it's built a stronger community for us. It's been an eye-opening experience, and um, uh, a lot of the elderly um, have been um, placed. I believe, I, I think, um, like I said earlier, some of the, our folks that are elderly have gone to their family members. And so we're fortunate that no one was injured. Uh, all of the animals were, they got out. Uh, this did happen Wednesday, um, April 21st at, I think the fire started around 1.45. And uh, there was one dog that we felt like wasn't going to make it, but it, our, our firemen did their thing and they got that dog out, gave him some oxygen and, uh, and everyone got out. It, it was a miracle that everyone got out. So we're very grateful for, for that. Very grateful for that. And um, I don't even know what's needed right now other than prayer. And, um, and um, do y'all have any questions? We're well, definitely sorry to hear about that and definitely keep uh, the residents there in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, I know Commissioner John Paul, you joined them for uh, their meeting uh, a couple of days ago. Sunday, yes. Do you have any questions or any concerns or, or how did you, this is, I believe this is your district, so. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I did have a couple of questions for you, Ms. Stankey. Uh, do you know if there are uh, you said you weren't really sure what's needed yet. That's, that's of course, the thing that uh, we're most concerned with um, dealing with. Um, and part of, part of our thought was that um, it's conceivable that uh, rental assistance could be helpful to some of the people who were displaced from Building 1. Do you oh, yes. have any idea how many, uh, how many renters are displaced from there? Um, we're still collecting that. Um... We do have three, uh, we have two medical doctor in their research phase that are looking for housing. We have um, a young lady that works with Oshners. I believe she is looking for housing. Uh, she's in unit one. Some of those details we can give on a more, a more personal level. Um, okay. We have uh, another individual who's actually in one of my units. My unit was impacted on the, on the bottom floor and he has been placed in another unit uh, once he starts back. Um, our elder seniors, um, First Baptist, uh, the Masada, uh, I believe it's Baptist Ministries, they've reached out and, and they've placed uh, two individuals and they do and can accommodate more. It's very limited. Uh, it's kind of a landing pad for for folks, but they can stay there an extended amount of time. Um, some of the others, we, we can reach out and, and certainly um, get back with you guys and John Paul um, with any other additional rental needs, yes. Okay, thank you. Well, we have been, we have been thinking uh, about uh, maybe doing an emergency ordinance to try to help meet some of the needs that have emerged from the fire there but i think uh since since we have so little information about what ex exactly those yeah. needs are right now it might be better to hold off on that and you and i can talk uh during the rest okay. of this week during the rest of this week as you get more info i think uh, i think that that's perfectly fine um we do and there will be more needs come up i think mainly these people want their stuff out and right. um, yeah. it's dangerous it's very dangerous um first and second floor um, you know, everything's wet, uh, it is drying up, but, uh, the third floor, you know, the ceiling, the ceiling collapsed on the third floor. So limited access up there. It's very dangerous. It's hard hat, you know, gloves, boots. And, um, but thank you so much for the consideration. We'd like to leave that consideration open. And certainly once we get more information, um, we, and we've had several people um, to, we've had several people reach out, several of the churches. Um, but I, let me share uh, our, our email is uh, Fairfield Oaks, HOA at gmail.com. 
Kathy is our, um, our manager, office manager there. And uh, so that's a good email to, to reach with questions, inquiries. Uh, again, that's fairfieldoatshoa.com. I'm sorry, at gmail.com. Stephen? Also, yeah, I can... Yes, sir. Okay. I, Hold on I just, one moment, Miss Susan. I wanted to let Susan know that she perhaps could reach out to the SBA also to get to seek assistance for the HOA. So, Susan, um, I'll put my information in the uh, chat box, and perhaps uh, the HOA, you and I, can talk about how the SBA Thank could you. be of assistance. Okay. Okay. I think that I I, I happened to write your name down when I, I heard your um, your information, and I definitely wrote your name down. So and it's not. It's 916-878-1495. Feel free to give me a call after the conference is over and we can chat. 916-878-1495. I'm in sunny California. Okay. Mr. Kumar, right? Oh, that's my dad. I'm Sushil. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, oh, guys. Okay. You're Sushil. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, you know, after, the formal, after the formalities are over, I'm Sushil. In the meantime, you know, Mr. Kumar, Mr. K, whatever. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you, John Paul, for bringing this to our attention. Uh, we, we definitely always want to respond when residents come. Uh, the reason why I think the emergency ordinance, I, I would encourage those who qualify for the rental assistance to go ahead. Uh, and try to see those, and they have to be those that are renters, uh, not necessarily those who are uh, who are owner occupied. Um, I, yes, um, I do have um, I do have some names and numbers of of medical, and one young lady who works with Oshners. Uh, she is uh, definitely needing rental assistance right, right now. We have Sherpa who is not, you know, this is the other thing. These, some of our folks need some counseling. We, do. Um, we need, we need uh, uh, some counseling. So if anyone could, uh, you know, maybe give us some insight or lead us into the right direction of counseling for, for a couple of our, a couple of our uh, folks, um, it's a catastrophic fire. And, and many of these people have lost everything. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I we had a little 95 year old man who was so near and dear that came up and he said, I don't even have family. And I, yeah. this is my home. And so uh, I've helped place him in the Masada program. He's right now actually at the sleep in hotel over by uh, Oshner's. So uh, if y'all need some names and numbers, um, John Paul, if you want to reach out, uh, Stephen, Mr. Jackson, sure, if you want to yes. reach out, uh, we'll be happy to provide you with some names of those folks who really, really that don't know where to turn. And uh, we're we're working very hard and doing our very best, and that's one reason why I'm here uh, with you guys today to to reach out to those folks. Um, yes. Uh, well, I think your commissioner is on it. I think the, uh, definitely get those who qualify for the rental assistance to go that route. They still will have to meet the 80% uh, AMI or 30%, 30, 80, 80% AMI? 80%. 80%. They still would have to meet that 80% AMI. Uh, and then there's still um, those who wouldn't, that's where the emergency ordinance would have probably come in at. And so uh, I think your commissioner is, is on, on top of it. Um, but as soon as you can get that information to them, we may be able to reconvene, uh, take that item through committee and uh, make a recommendation to the full body. Uh, I can just tell you what we always want to remind people is our process. And as you just heard us talking about with the rental assistance program, there can be layers and steps. And so um, as you all are going through the rebuilding, and I know the trauma, my I had an apartment burnt down. Uh, I didn't set the fire. Somebody else set it in mind, just caught on. But, uh, and this was about yeah. maybe 10 years ago. And so I, trust me, I, I get it. And so, uh, so definitely yeah. uh, make sure that they're mindful that government doesn't move as quick as some of the nonprofit agencies. Oh, yes. So whatever it is we would need to do 
uh, please get with Commissioner John Paul Young so uh, he can um, he can properly advise the body on what our next step should be. Yes. All right. And, and yeah. AMI is area medium income. Income, yes, ma'am. Okay. Area medium income, yes, ma'am. All right, and uh, thank you, Mr. Shashil, for for uh, also. I think SBA does have some great programs that can probably help those homeowners, uh, and I believe they have support for uh, rental assistance. And I see where uh, Dr. Martha White just uh, dropped in the uh, SAMHSA line for uh, uh, the distress help line. Vernon so, uh, Chase. I'm sorry, not my. I thought I, I'm looking at Dr. White, but Mrs. Chase, Myrna Chase, just uh, dropped that in. So sounds like you, Miss Susan, you're in the right place at the right time because we got all the resources and help here for you. Well, we have a strong board, and um, you know we we we've got boots on the ground, and yes, uh, it, it's we want to be here for these people, and uh, we're doing everything that we can do. And if there's anything that we're not doing that we need to be doing, please let us know. Uh, we we do embrace this community. It's a good it's a good a good community, and no one should ever have to go through this. So yeah. we're trying to to provide as much comfort as possible, and uh, and we're doing it. We're doing it. So yeah. with y'all's help, we'll 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 make it all happen. And mm -hmm. I do understand about um, how long it does take. Uh, sometimes things the process is. We're looking at a long time. We understand that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're not just here with you. We're here for you. Thank you. I well, appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, are we good, Commissioner John Paul? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's everything. Okay. All right. Um, uh, are we good to go to the next thing, Mr. Clerk? Or do we want to go back up to uh, Dr. Are, uh but you're right, uh, Dr. White is on the line. And, okay. um, it, you know, if you'd like to go back to that, I think that'd be appropriate. Also, okay. um, just for Susan's reference, I know that uh, Dr. White did mention in the comments that the health district has crisis counseling teams uh, locally that may be of assistance in their situation. Thank you. Yes, that's Mr. Doug Efferson and his group. And I can put his phone number in the chat if that would help. Great. Thanks, Doc. Please. Susan, are you able to see these numbers or are you on us via call on the phone? Susan here. Susan, if you're talking, you're on mute. Thank you. No. Yeah. Um, can y'all hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. So um, are you can you see the chat or are you on via phone? I'm on my phone. Okay, so what we'll do, what we what we can do is we'll uh, gather. Uh, Jeff, I think you can download this chat. I think and we, we can, and and we can make sure that uh, Miss Stanky gets the information. We'll reach okay. out. Okay, yeah, the number that uh, Ms., that Mrs. Chase provided, and then that information that uh, Dr. White has, as well as uh, uh, Shashil's information as well. Make sure that she gets those. Okay, so. From what I understand, and um, I'll, I'll, John Paul, maybe I'll receive something from you or Jeff Everson. Yes, ma'am. Um, One okay, of the perfect. Um, yes, my email is, um, let me give you all my email. It's susan.o.standke, S-T-A-N-D-K-E, at gmail.com. Um, just, in, I think, uh, you know, and a personal email might be a little easier um, than the HOA. Uh, we're, we're flooded with stuff right now, not, not only trying to discover in our day-to-day -day business, but to, to run the interference with uh, the, the building one, too. So, uh, yeah, so it's susan.o.standkey at gmail.com. All right. Thank you, Ms. Okay, Susan. thank you. Okay, right. thank you okay. so much thank for you. having me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Dr. White, uh, glad to have you. Doc, we just was trying to get an update on uh, where we are as it relates to uh, our test positive rate, uh, testing and uh, vaccination update. So um, thank you for having me and I'm sorry I'm late. I, I had some health issues, but- um, I understand, it's okay. <laughs> our, doing well. Oh, uh, thank you. Our, 
our percent positivity is hanging around 4.3, 4, 4.5% for Caddo Parish, um, still below the 5%, which is where we want it. The concern is that we really don't have people testing. Um, even if they're not feeling well, people aren't going to get tested. So do we truly have an understanding of what is going on in the community with COVID disease load? We do know it's lower. We know that the number of people in the hospital um, is definitely dropped. You remember for over a year, we were in triple digits. We are now in the 30s and 40s each week, um, which is tremendous. I mean, I was wasn't sure we were going to get there for a while, um, but we've been staying, I think today we are, I can look it up, but I think we were 37 and then 35 and we go to 41. So it kind of goes up and down a little bit, but staying right around that number. Um, we are seeing some younger people in the ICUs. Um, just had a good friend, 27. Well, he's 26. He'll turn 27 this year admitted to the ICU this weekend. So we are seeing some, you know, some younger people get sicker, which makes us concerned about these variants that you're hearing about. One of the good news is that um, LSU, their Emerging Viral Threat Lab is getting a um, grant to do sequencing for the state. So we will be able to do more sequencing um, not in this area, but also from around the state to kind of help us see what exactly is going on around us. Um, we have been definitely testing anyone who's had what we call a breakthrough case, meaning they've had COVID before and then get it again. We want to sequence them. And also if they've had the vaccination, been fully vaccinated and then turn positive with COVID, we want to um, sequence their uh, strain and make sure that it's um, not one that we need to be specifically worried about, like the Brazil strain or um, the South African strain. And, you know, if you look at what's going around the world, you know, if you look at what's going on in the state, it looks really good. And that's very exciting. And we need to keep moving forward. Um if you look at what's going on around the world, it's concerning. When you look at India that has 1.5 million cases in a week, um, 300,000 cases in a day, um, having to burn bodies because there's no place to bury them, um, having 20 people die on ventilators because the oxygen ran out and there was no way to keep oxygen flowing for these people. We, we definitely don't want to see anything like that here. We saw an outbreak in Canada, which is a little close for my comfort, um, with that Brazilian strain, 880 people. Um, with that, that strain is the one that we're concerned about treatment for because it does not respond to monoclonal antibody treatment, like the Regeneron. So we really um, don't want that coming to us. Um, so as far as, um, so we do need to be cautious and we do need to be aware, um, do need to make sure that if we're not feeling well, we get tested. We need to make sure that if we're in large groups and we don't know if people have been vaccinated or if we have not been vaccinated, that we still wear our masks. Um, I know the governor here is considering lifting his mask mandate. Um, and putting it more on municipalities. Um, whether he'll do that in the next few days, I'm not sure, but that's what we're hearing rumblings of. Um, similar to what Texas did, and you know, if you've traveled in Texas, there are some municipalities that are still very strict about masks and some that are, let's say you do what you wanna do. Um, Again, when you hear about, well, they're not seeing an increase in cases, we're also not seeing testing. So right. that, <laughs> that right. may be the reason for that. Everybody's um, looking for the vaccine, not the test. Right. Now, vaccines, you know, we did really well in this area. We were blessed because we had our hospitals all come together and put together that fairgrounds field site. That did a great job for us at first, and it, it met its need. 
What we know now is large mass vaccination sites are not what we need. We need in community um, sites. So that's really what we've been working on both with National Guard and with, um, we have strike teams available through National Guard. We also have, um, you know, of course, Dr. Van Cherry strike teams and public health. Um, some people really don't respond well to National Guard coming into their community. So we have to be considerate of that, um, that feel, those feelings. Um, but we are trying to if, if, search for through social vulnerability indexes of the census tracts and looking at um, vaccination uptake, trying to find sites and areas where we're not seeing good uptake. Um, we recently did uh, a door-to-door -door canvassing door knocks and talking to people with community um, canvassers, um, people that per hopefully the community knows and trusts um, in Allendale and the MLK area to try to talk to people about their concerns and their fears, and then did a vaccination clinic through David Rains. David Rains has done a lot of vaccinations, not a lot from MLK though. Those people have not taken advantage of that as, as much as we had hoped. So when you look at the percentage of uptake, we did get about 150 people to get vaccinated this weekend. So that's 150 people there that had not been, um, but we wanna keep working on that. Gonna be doing a lot of those sites around my nine parishes. Still, if we have um, people request, we have churches and um, we've been with the Association for the Blind, people who are having difficulty working on some homebound programs. Um, so really just trying to get it out there. We have got about 27% of our population vaccinated um, that are eligible to be vaccinated. <clears throat> um, but we still have a long way to go to reach that herd immunity and we have a lot of resistance. That's kind of really all I have, um, Commissioner. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, Doc. And um, I know your work and your hands are tied, uh, covering your entire region. Does any commissioners have any questions for Dr. White uh, as it relates to vaccines? Uh, Commissioner Epperson? Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. White, you yes. said you have people don't want the National Guard coming to their community. Now, this is the same National Guard that, that come and get people out of floods when their homes are torn up, no electricity, bringing in, uh, ME, MREs, water, ice. What's with that? I had that in Caddo Parish yet. I had it mainly in, like, I've had DeSoto Parish tell me that, Sabine Parish. Some areas um, that are just really have not welcomed them in, especially people who feel like, you know, they're buying into that whole government conspiracy theory, the idea of then government coming in, trying to give them these shots. They don't really feel welcoming. Okay. To thank you. Thank you. That answers my question. Uh, I just want to make, uh, uh, make an announcement that the Mount Olive Baptist church in Greenwood, Louisiana, on the inter uh -huh. intersection of Buncombe Road and Highway 169. That will cover rural areas. They're going to be doing a vaccination on Friday, May 7th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It'll be the, uh, the, the Moderna vaccine. Uh, and that should encompass, and we're getting the words out to the people around Bethany and all that rural areas of uh, Greenwood and West Cattle Parish that's going to the Texas line. Thank That's you. wonderful. Can you tell me who's helping you? Who's helping you supply that vaccine and that thing is you know uh, to give the LSU time? LSU Oshins. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. And we're 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 going to focus heavy uh, in the uh, in the rural areas of West Caddo and South Caddo Parish, uh, yes. to, and west to the Texas line on those right. rural areas. And if anyone has a request like that, just get it to myself or Dr. John Van Cherry. Um, and we are happy to try to make that happen because we are not going to get people at these large sites. We're not seeing them come to pharmacies. So we're going to have to come to them. 
And um, hopefully if they see their friends and people that they love and trust go and get vaccinated, perhaps that will help. Thanks, Dr. White. I, I, I got a, a couple of questions. Um, the um, daily sites the, or the daily numbers, do you know, uh, and maybe just a guesstimation of what the daily numbers when you started the mass sites, what was that? What, what that may have turned oh, yeah. out? We were doing approximately 1,500 a day. Okay, okay. and um, as you go into the neighborhoods, are you seeing that number, or would you expect that number to be much lower because it's more okay. neighborhood specific? Right, I think if we get into triple digits with these local in community neighbor, you know, neighborhood sites, smaller sites, we're happy. <laughs> we would, you know, it may mean that we need to come back, right. you know, multiple times so that you know more people um have the chance once they've seen their friends get it that's one thing we have seen is once they know people people know people who've gotten it and done fine and done well then they are a little bit more likely to take it um i i just did um the powwow down in ebarb and we were really happy to get 30 people because they you know they don't have they're just not buyers into right. <laughs> into right. medical care. And so we were happy to see that happen. So we're happy to come, even if we get 10 people, you know, maybe those 10 people will go spread the word. <laughs> that makes sense. No, that makes sense. And I saw in New Orleans, and I don't know if you saw it, where they did shots for shots. Um, I, you know, I, I thought about doing something that like that to kind of capture the younger crowd. But what I, I was, I guess, I was concerned about mixing alcohol with the vaccine. Is that safe? Is that okay? It, What's your problem? It's, it's safe. I mean, there's no problem with you know taking a shot after you get the vaccine, and we've we've seen that as well. We're looking at incentives, Commissioner, like um, even small gift cards or mm -hmm. i mean t even t-shirts just it, people enjoy little giveaways and so um for example at that powwow we gave away ball caps and you would not believe the people who wanted the ball caps you know um so i i do think that anything unique like that that will help people um you know pay attention to us is definitely I, I didn't see the number as to how many they actually did. I knew in um, Baton Rouge they tried it. It wasn't very successful, but I think they had some issue going on, like with weather or something, so they were going to try it again. So so you're saying that it, it is perfectly <laughs> – you say – so. <laughs> it's not going to harm you to get a, a shot when you get a, a shot of alcohol. <laughs> Really? Okay. I just was curious about the safety of it because, you know, David Arbery has that little place over there, Louisiana Daiquiri, that is, uh, and I would love to maybe test run it, some concept over there, uh, see if David and his team, I don't know if you know David Arbery, but uh, Louisiana Daiquiri Cafe, see if, you know, they may be open to, you know, hey, come get a shot, I mean, come get your vaccine and free daiquiri, some something like that. So just some throwing it out there. I thought it was very interesting, very unique. And uh, but I also was wondering, was it safe? So yeah, it's safe. And um we I'll try to get the numbers from them, how successful okay. it was. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have any questions for Dr. White? Well, Doc, we definitely appreciate you. Uh we've run about way over what we normally do, but um I think I think this was a very productive meeting. Jeff, did we have anything else? The final item was just the update on American Rescue Plan, uh, oh, local okay. government funds. Okay. Yes, yeah, sir. Real quickly, um, we're hearing that we may get uh, some guidelines May 6th. What we're getting is still informal through NACO, through some other organizations. Um, we're hearing that uh, we should get that first deposit maybe around May 11th or so. Um, so, and I know the other committee is supposed to be calling a committee meeting um, next week, I believe. I'm not sure. Um, so when we get more information, we'll continue to provide that, but we're still about where we were um, with the limited information that's already been provided. Gotcha. Uh, thank you, Ms. Brown. Henry, I see you on the phone. Henry, uh, is there anything that, is there anything that, I don't know, legally, 
I know that committee was formed, but all committees or all all commissioners can start working on that fund or those dollars, right? I don't know that any one committee or one person can dictate that. I had never seen that in the charter and our bylaws. I'm sorry, and but what was your that fund? So those funds, anybody, any committee can work with those funds, right? Because I didn't see anything that that excluded any other committee from working on those funds. That I would have to go back and look at when the committee was set up. Well, it was um, a, it's an ad hoc committee, so nobody. Sir, no and one. and from that standpoint, of course, um, any committee is going to have to refer it to the full body for formal action anyway. Absolutely. So I, I, I'm just saying, so this committee, we can really start working on priorities that we may have for, that, for those funds. Would that be safe to say? That would be a question for the commission president who set them up. Well, I mean, I don't know that the commission, and I'm asking you as our attorney, I don't know that any one commissioner can determine or dictate what funds, who, because there was no legislation that set the committee up. And I, I've never seen one commissioner be able to dictate who spends what fund or what committee spends on what fund. That usually is done. No, that's correct. I mean, that's that's correct. You know, neither an individual commissioner nor an individual committee can can make that formal decision. Right. Um, but that would be really that's a parliamentary procedure question for the body. Is that parliament? OK, or well, that wouldn't be the charter or bylaw. No, sir, because the, the committees aren't addressed in the charter. But they're, they're addressed in our bylaws, right? Correct. And so and the, the commission approved, those are commission approved committees that are in our bylaws. Is, is that a, as how is that how they got us there? While the while the bylaws do set out uh, the committee, uh, I'll say turf or jurisdiction, mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing in the bylaws that provide for exclusivity. Right. That's what I, that's kind of how I was reading them. And yeah. I don't, I just wanted to see Jeff, were you, I see Commissioner Epperson, uh, Commissioner Epperson. Uh, yes, sir. I would, uh, any committee can make recommendations. Uh, oh. The committee can make recommendations, vote out a committee and anything that we do, we have to go to the full body anyway. So we okay. certainly that certainly would be on our purview. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that you know, as as a committee, we are not encroaching anywhere. So I, I will our next meeting we'll start convening and discussing, um, particularly around those concepts of what we can do. Uh, Miss Bryant, I thought I heard you say earlier when we talked earlier on the phone that uh, it seemed like the goal was for those dollars to be more uh, revenue replacement but also kind of things that help individuals kind of recover from this pandemic and things of that nature? Yes, sir. It could be revenue replacement from what I'm hearing, um, helping with COVID uh, issues, infrastructure, economic development, um, those type of things, um, hazard pay. So um, it's, I think the thing that we're hearing consistently is not meant for expenses, uh, you know, don't generate an expense just to use these dollars, but they, um, in, uh, we're hearing they want you to invest in your community. And so those are the type of um, projects that we would, uh, that you all would need to um, look at what's um, investing in your community, what's investing in your, what's helping us for the, cause you know, we do have revenue shortfall where we can replace some of those revenues in order to still provide the programs that um, we're accustomed to providing. Um, and then those um, long-term impact type of projects too. So, I mean, it's, you know, there's no specific guidelines. We're just kind of guessing right now, but um, that's where we're, what we're hearing. Jeff, did you have anything that you, I thought I saw maybe your hand up or something or highlight. I did not. Okay. Uh, but, well, I, you know, it, Our employees have not, they still work through the pandemic, right? Yes, yeah, so we worked through the pandemic. We had uh, folks on hand, never missed. I mean, we continue to pay bills, continue to make payroll, continue to uh, pick up animals, um, continue to uh, address our road situation. Our, you know, our solid waste um, uh, site stayed open. So, yes, well, yep. feel like they, we feel like they did a great job through the pandemic. Okay. What'd you say, Mr. Epperson? 
uh, help with water and food distribution. Help with water, Bird food distribution. Mm -hmm. Help clear ice through the unusual snowstorm yeah, that uh, we didn't expect. <laughs> and a pandemic at the same time. I, I, I just want to, I'm going to probably take, I'm going to take a chair's privilege and I'd like to make a, a motion that we would provide a supplement uh, paid to our parish employees for one-time supplement heroes pay of $1,000 for uh, frontline parish employees, if I can get a second on that. I second, Mr. Jim. Thank you. Yeah, I, I you know, y'all just spoke to it. They, they did a yeoman's job. We we did those testing sites and, and those young men who are out at the testing site, they were, they were the, and, and I don't know who their supervisors is, but they were the first ones there and the last ones to leave. And, and I believe one of them told me one time that uh, I was in the way uh, because, you know, I was out trying to help set stuff up and help them out. And they don't want you to come out and do any work. They just want you to show up, uh, talk to residents. And uh, I agree, they've worked hard throughout this pandemic. And uh, I've seen where the city has provided a supplement for uh, their employees. I see where the school board is now providing a supplement for their employees. And so, I, you know, I just think um, our employees are very much deserving of the same pat on the back. Um, well, I mean, I know we I worried y'all to death. Uh, so, well, we agree. We were um, thinking oh, about well, y'all agree. I worried y'all to death. <laughs> <laughs> we were thinking on the same line. Now, we did have a number of 1500 trying to be where the sheriff was and trying to ensure some actually clear nearly a thousand dollars because you know you got to tax it. But we well, will I follow mean, the direction of the commission. I'll make an amendment to 1500 then. I'll second the amendment. All right. Any more discussion on that? Thank you. We appreciate that. Y'all want me to do a roll call? Yes, sir. All right. Commissioner Jackson. Yes. Commissioner Gage Watts. Commissioner Epperson. Yes. Commissioner Young. Yes. And Commissioner Johnson. That motion carries with three of five and two absent. All right. And uh, Mr. Clark, if you could get with the... Uh, Parish administration, and, and we can have that on for consideration. And obviously, it would be reimbursed or it would be available when those dollars become available. We'll do it. Either or, however, y'all set it up. Is there anything else to come before the committee at this particular time? Move for adjournment, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thanks, everybody. And I apologize for running about 30 minutes over, but thank y'all. Appreciate it. Everybody be safe and have a good day.